Yeah, welcome to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. American Issues Take Two. <clears throat> Understanding the move to global autocracy happening. Um, understanding the causes and factors in play. And we have my co-host, uh, Tim Apicella. We have our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoll-Dalton. And we have a special esteemed guest, Alexander Morawa. Uh, Alexander is a, a, a teacher in American University in Washington, D.C. So we want to uh, examine the remarkable growth in autocrats and autocratic governments around the world, including just a touch of few, China, Russia, Hungary, so many other places in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, especially Southeast Asia, and the rise of autocratic right-wing movements in other countries that tend toward autocracy, and the takeover by military hunters in so many countries. And what that means to the United States, which has its own issues, what it means to Europe in general and the liberal world order. Um, we are at a global inflection point. That is my suggestion to you all. Uh, Tim, you know, let me ask you, uh, you know, what is going on? Uh, is this the water, the air? Is it climate change? Is it, is it a change in the human species? Why are we at this point in our global history? Well, yesterday we tackled the subject of uh, social media and how that now is more efficient to spread ideas, falsehoods, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. And these are the, you know, this is a ripe, fertile playground for would be dictators. Um, the fact that I could get access to everyone's um, mind uh, with a simple, you know, simple phone in their hands. And, you know, it's an opportune time to describe the fact that most governments are polarized. It's an opportune time to discuss how inefficient governments and democracy is and try to fill that void with your solution. And your solution is uh, autocracy, dictatorship. And again, it's, it's to point out how government is horrible, they're corrupt, and they have little ability to improve the lives of the people around them in the country. And they're the solution. Donald Trump says, only I can fix it. Vladimir Putin says, only you can trust me. These are classic words from a would-be dictator, uh, fascists, that uh, promote themselves as the solution to a nation of people who would have grievances. And that's what's going on today. You know, we have a correspondent in Varanasi, India, which is uh, 350 kilometers from the northern northeastern border of India. And he's in, in school, and his school is right near the Ganges River. And he's a graduate student there in business. So I asked him a couple of years ago, um, do you like Donald Trump? And he said, this is apropos to your comments, Tim. Uh, and he said, yeah, I do. I said, why? Why in the world would you like Donald Trump? You're, you're educating yourself. What's your analysis? And he said, I quote, because he is strong. So I think we're at a time somehow where people, maybe it's because of social media, and I'm interested in the, you know, the other members of the panel on this, um, feel that they need to have, quote, strong, end quote, leaders. And it's that whole uh, search for strength whether you can realize it or not, is another question. So, Stephanie, what are your thoughts about this? Um, do, are we at a time where we need, quote, strong leaders? Um, what makes us, what puts us at that time? I think we're in a major default process here, uh, which I first uh, noticed when I was in, um, ba in Baghdad. And having wonderful... Um, Iraqi women friends and, and colleagues there. And, and when things would get really crazy, I would hear from these highly educated Iraqi women, oh, you know, we need a strong man, a strong man, which is of course, as you know, what they had. So there, there's some sort of default here to, I guess what was good for us for a millennium 
you know, as we came out of the cave and had to face, you know, the um, mammoths or the lions. So um, that that has been the the formula, right? That's been um, the algorithm <laughs> for mankind for centuries. Got to have the strongest guy that can carry the biggest uh, stick and do the most damage to those we perceive as dangerous. So I, I, I it bewilders me. And then, and same thing when those women would say that. And I would just stop dead in my tracks and look at them. And then finally, they're kind of, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, well, okay. So these egomaniacal, mostly men who raise themselves up to fulfill these atavistic or ancient needs are still out there thinking that they, that's appropriate, that that's what they're supposed to do. And there are many people that go along with that and think that, yeah, that's the way we're supposed to be organized. So back to the monarchy or back to, you know. Well, was it always, was it always thus, Stephanie? Um, you know, that maybe we just didn't realize uh, the need of the, the people everywhere to have a strong leader. We just didn't realize it. Um, and we only realizing it now in contradistinction to the enlightened, you know, enlightened view that uh, there should be diversity, there should be democracy, representation, representation, government, and all that. There's civil rights, human rights. Maybe we didn't have those things before. We didn't realize that we were suffering under this kind of uh, uh, autocratic leadership. And now we see the difference and it is stark. Am I am I hitting a point there that you can you can respond to? Thank you. I I do do think you are. You've made me realize that I think we need to get to strength 2.0. What is strong? What is strong? What was strong? We know what that was, and and it got us to where we are. Now we need strong. Yes, and what is it? We've got to redefine it as the 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 way uh, that we approach problem solving and conflict resolution and, you know, living together on the planet. What are the strengths that that help us in that circumstance? It's not just the guy with the stick, you know, so we, we just need to recognize the fan, fabulous strengths that are out there that have gotten us, you know, beyond the need for the strong man. So anyway, Alexander, I, you're, Alexander you're, you can help us with the nuance on this. But when you start talking about autocracy and uh, hunters around the world, you have to realize that it's different in different places. Um, and and uh, we we look to you uh, to we look to you to fix all this, Alexander. To tell to tell us what's really going on from a, an academic examination, uh, and to tell us um, you know what the nuances are. Well, my, my background is in law, and I can assure you that lawyers are not the best people to fix everything. I, 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 would, I would think that's really in the hands of others, better placed there. Uh, but let me say something that probably helps a little bit. Uh, I always love to look at it through the lens of history. Back at a time when the world was kind of comprehensible for people, generally speaking, because it was simpler, we wrote books. Now it's so complex that nobody knows anything anymore and we write tweets. And in tweets, everybody's an expert, right? Uh, so I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have simplified our communication to a level where the complexity is absolutely lost. And that leads to simple answers. I mean, that's where people say we need a simple answer because a simple answer is a, is a good thing. Uh, another thing history teaches us, democracy was not primarily something that did regular elections. Democracy, as the Greeks envisioned it 2,500 years ago, was that strong leaders would actually lead society. But strong meant quality, not the stick. It meant the intellect, the abilities to actually make the right decisions. And those leaders would also have the quality of finding that their role as leader is an honor. It's part of an honest structure in the Roman a republic was built on that. People were, of course, also earning money on the side and sometimes ripping off the places they went to. But it was an honor system where people would do it as part of their life cycle. Uh, and they would know that stepping down and passing it on to other people was a crucial element of being a strong leader. When we look at history, I think democracy had a meaning that goes way beyond just uh, one person, one vote. It means that the leadership would be strong because of quality. It would be strong because of a, a knowing, a knowing that they need to also step aside and, and, and let let things pass into 
different hands. And uh, those autocratic leaders we have today do not understand that. I mean, if you start with Xi and you move on to any other autocratic leader, they think they're there for eternity and they need to be there as the leader. They, they can't be the honored past leader. It's an impossibility. Yeah, let me let me ask you about one thing. You said that um, it's not not your wheelhouse because um, you're a lawyer and you're steeped in the law, teaching law, what have you. But you know, I have felt that the the revelation um, that we experience in this country uh, shows you a couple of things. One is that social media creates chaos. It is the very opposite of the rule of law. Is every as you said, everyone is an expert, um, and and the chaos visits our institutions. It means that you can tear an institution down. You can create institutional chaos. Um, on the other hand, uh, lawyers, um, most of whom um, are trained to practice the law rather than to use the law to uh, solidify our rule of law and our institutions, uh, don't take that burden. They do not take that burden, except in rare circumstances. And, uh, you know, and, and when they get into office, as so many in Congress, um, it, it doesn't help that they have legal training, <laughs> or at least it doesn't help positively that they have legal training. They, uh, they, they, they make a cute perversions of the law, as we have seen in Congress. And so my question to you is, um, you know, they, they seem to be diametrically opposed. The notion of social media and chaos in the, in the public conversation versus the idea of the rule of law, and who is best prepared to advance and protect and preserve the rule of law but lawyers. So what I'm saying is, um, does this reflect uh, a kind of failure of that, of that profession? Does this suggest that going forward, one solution to the chaos is to redefine the role of the lawyer in, in society here and elsewhere? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't blame the legal profession as such for failing in this respect. I think the law is by and large reactive in response to societal changes, and it's usually with delay, and the delay can be from uh, an hour to more usually 10, 20 years. Uh, so we're just moving at our usual pace, and society moves a lot faster. I believe. Uh, maybe one word of caution: we, we shouldn't demonize social media either. If you look at Iran, that's probably the only way for the society to communicate against the government and to bring up new ideas, which ultimately, hopefully, will lead to a democratic change. There, nobody knows, of course. Uh, and then the question is, of course, you know, if you if you want to regulate social media. Uh, good luck. I mean, herding cats becomes a, a favorite pastime of me if, if, if that would be an option. Uh, I cannot possibly imagine how to regulate social media, even with the best of intentions, because it is constantly changing. While we draft the law, people already draft tweets to say we will not have tweets anymore, we will have tweets, and then the law will not apply to tweets because it's something different. So I think we, we will not be able to regulate that. And and and. Call me a heretic here, but maybe that's a good idea. I think society should regulate itself as much as possible. Alexander Michael John said, you know, free speech is a, is a, it's a marketplace of ideas. Uh, right now, we're just not good at weeding out the stupid ideas and, and, and limiting ourselves to the good ideas. That's because we're writing short things and not books anymore. My sarcastic comments, I apologize for using the S word in this context. Before I let you go on that, I, I want to offer the thought that, uh, you know, you can use social media to organize the most negative possible events, uh, events that undermine democracy, that move to autocracy um, and, you know, destroy civil rights and, uh, you know, the rule of law. Uh, so my question is, if, if it's um, if like herding cats, and then certainly, you know, you could make that argument very effectively, um, but it's also very destructive. Uh, and it is being used by people who are destructive, such as autocrats, as a tool uh, to gain control. And I suppose when I say social media, I'm also talking about the Internet in general, because uh, that's part of it. It is it's part of it for Vladimir Putin, for sure. Um, so so my question is, if, if we let it go free, if we let it have its way um, and not try to regulate it or do anything to... Mm, mm, 
put guardrails around it, um, aren't we risking our society? Absolutely. I mean, you could say the First Amendment is something very American. I'm not sure whether it's fully appropriate anymore at this point in time. In other societies, the approach to what you can say and what you can't say has been used differently. Look at Germany as an example. They make a differentiation between expression of facts and expression of opinion. Right? Opinion is free. You can have any opinion you want. But a court can step in and, and look into what are the facts you present are actually fact-based or manufactured out of thin air, like we see sometimes, and then you can be sanctioned for that. Um, I would think in the global context, that might be a very useful tool of distinguishing between uh, the marketplace of ideas versus the non-marketplace of facts to a certain extent. I mean, some facts are just uh, to be taken as a, as a foundation for your ideas, but not manipulated that well. Oh, wow, Tim. He's offering so many thoughts that you have expressed. Uh, you, you, I feel like you have to weigh in now. Well, thank you, Alexander, because <laughs> Jay's right. I, I've expressed a hundred times on this show and other shows that the media is um, guilty of this, is, is the blending of facts and opinion at the same news desk, whereas media used to be in the 60s and 70s a separate desk, and it was clearly delineated as a news desk versus the editorial desk or the opinion desk. So yeah, thank you, Alexander. Um, to hit your point <clears throat> about not blaming the, 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 the attorneys for, for the rule of law or in the diminishment of the rule of law, I agree. Um, 1980s and 90s, we had enough attorney jokes that you know bashed the attorneys quite well, and we don't need any more of that. However, I will bash <laughs> the education system. No offense, Stephanie, but, and we've talked about this. Um, Civics 101 the importance of democracy, the comparative uh, governments in the world, and, and how that uh, system of government in Iran or China or Russia is vastly different than the United States or, or in Europe. Um, comparative government studies. Uh, we don't see those classes anymore in high school. And how do you know if you're losing democracy if you don't know what democracy is in the first place? And I've seen many times, in fact, even with the... Um, the athlete case, I can't remember her name, where people take for granted their Bill of Rights and their freedoms. And they transfer that assumption and that privilege to other countries that don't honor the Bill of Rights. And then when they get in trouble, they go, what's wrong? I'm an American. You can't do this to me. Well, guess what? They can. And in case of, um, what's her last name? Gr Grinder? Grinder. 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 She the found California. out the very hard way that what you get away from going from Alabama down to North Carolina is quite different than from her, her place in, in the United States to Moscow. And I see it all the time when I travel internationally, um, this real naivete from Americans about their rights and the expression of their rights. Well, <clears throat> uh, Stephanie, uh, you know, I think in large part we've been talking, uh, Tim and just now I've been talking about the experience here, the American experience. But I'm still interested in, in trying to figure out why we have so many autocracies around the world, more than I noticed before. Maybe I wasn't noticing, um, but I listed them before when we opened the show. And, and I wonder if it's education or social media in the same way we, we see it here in the United States, that's happening in Hungary, um, that, that's happening in Russia, that's happening in China, North Korea, for example, um, and so many places where it's moving to the right, moving to the right, uh, moving away from representative, representative government. Uh, so I'm looking to you to try to find whether the phenomena that we see in the United States uh, are happening everywhere, or is it just coincidence? Well, there are some rising, there's some evidence that it is happening everywhere. In fact, is it not in Germany, Alex? I mean, we've had that recent uh, coup, coup effort, which said that they were inspired by, or they were mimicking what they had seen in the United States. But, but this is the age old accompaniment to the strong man leading. I mean, Mao Tsung. I mean, Cambodia, all of these, the education system has to line up with all of that and does in these countries. 
And, um, and maybe that's one of the problems is the education system worldwide has remained fairly traditional, traditional approach. Well, in the early 30s, when Hitler took over, the first thing he looked to was the education system. And he yeah. created Hitler Youth, and he gave them a whole new life in school. And he, um, he, he made them into a different generation from what they might have been. And, and that was a big, a big strategy for him. Uh, and so if I'm if I'm an autocrat or I'm a would be autocrat, first thing I do is attack the education system. Also, I yes. attack the, also I attack the lawyers, Alexander. By the way, but, but the <laughs> and I attack the media. <laughs> yeah. but the education system can have lots of toys in it, and you know the flags and the marching and the uniforms and all the fun things. And then you also develop these ideals, which is something that needs to be done, the development of the ideal man for whatever country and who's the ideal woman and what are these roles supposed to be. So all of this has to be, a, it, you know, has to emerge from the effort um, of education and it does emerge that way. So uh, yeah, you're right. It would come right in and start taking over education and that's what they're doing. And, um, and I think COVID didn't help us with that either since it locked everybody up and took us back now to years ago uh, trying to build back these systems or and certainly the pedagogy that we've been trying to change and use that is more about um, people fulfilling their potential and being expressive and doing things in a more democratic manner than the traditional approach of just yeah, Alexander, I think we we struck on something. It's education, but it's not the kind of education about kids in school. It's education of one would be autocrat from reading about, thinking about, and educating himself or herself about autocrats elsewhere, finding out what the playbook is and using the same, very same playbook. And that's one way you can spread autocracy around the world. Do you agree? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the example that Stephanie gave with the German incident with the so-called Reichsbürger, I think is a good example. They certainly looked at January 6th as a playbook uh, and learn from it. I mean, they, they, they did the good old German thing. I mean, they tried to figure out what was not organized well and trying to organize it better. Uh, and their attempt certainly was at exactly those target groups that we're talking about, the media, the, the administration, not to call it the lawyers, but the high level administration, the education system. Uh, and they organized themselves in a, in a better way when, you, when you're talking about how uh, autocrats learn from the mistakes of others. So there's no doubt about uh, an international flow of information back and forth when it comes to autocrats and how they, how they act. Uh, I think we also have to bear in mind autocrats come to power in a certain way and then they want to stay in power in a certain way. We see in, in many European examples, now Erdogan being an example, and of course Urban in Hungary, uh, they are now in a stage of their life and their autocracy in a way where it's about survival and the future. Uh, most of those have one thing in common, namely no successor. Uh, they also have no transformation of ideology in case they themselves are not there any, any, anymore. So if you have a Xi uh, autocratic ideology in China, imagine a heart attack. It, it would quite literally decapitate the entire system that he built. The same would probably go for Erdogan and certain others. So I think it's a, it's a very complex uh, topic in itself to look at how to prevent autocracies and how to learn from the ends of autocracies. Uh, very last comment, education is the one thing that lingers. If you look at uh, the Germans after World War II, if you're being educated in um, March of 1945 as a Hitler follower, you're not going to be all of a sudden uneducated in May of 1945 and be a follower of a new democracy that somebody else imposes on you, which many of the Germans probably felt that at that point. So if you if you if you wrongly educate the children, that's going to be something that will keep um, pushing society in the wrong direction for a time. Uh, you know, education is only good for the generation that you're educating. They don't necessarily pass it on. Um, there's a movie uh, called The Reader, which examines, it's a very interesting movie, examines uh, the generational mm, mm, disaffection between the generation in Germany that was there in the war doing whatever they were doing, sometimes horrible things, and the generation that followed. The generation that followed was asking, what did you do in the war? 
And the war generation didn't answer them because they were embarrassed and ashamed. And so there was a gap between the generations. Um, this is very interesting. But the other point, you know, that Alexander mentioned is what happens, Tim, if the autocrat dies, if uh, she dies, if uh, uh, Kim Jong-un dies, um, it leaves a, a huge vacuum. And that vacuum is not really in the playbook because by definition, with an autocrat, there is no successor. And that's why it's of such great concern that a guy like Trump, you know, doesn't want to talk about a successor. He, he wants to stay in office forever, forever. And Putin, he wants to stay in office forever, for life. But, you know, built into that model is a horrendous crash after he's no longer there. What are your thoughts about what happens in that crash? What happens when the autocracy crashes for the lack of a successor? Well, the first thing you see, I, you know, there's, especially in South America, um, is a bloody struggle uh, for power. And you have alliances, <laughs> unholy alliances, uh, to support a would-be um, autocrat. And it goes from there. So everyone is strategizing, trying to gain control. And uh, you have basically the, the society uh, parked in neutral. Uh, it's not advancing. Um, basic needs are not being met because all the energy and synergy is focusing around uh, retainment of power or the, the quest for power. So it's detrimental to the society wholeheartedly not to have a line of succession or you know, a, a system in which a new government will be brought in. Uh, simple as that. You know, Alexander, one, one, uh, one point that uh, I would like to ask you about came up at a dinner party I was I was at last night, and it's the story of Tito uh, in, in Yugoslavia, um, who kept the lid on things for as long as he was in office. And he was in office essentially for life, wasn't he? Um, and uh, he was an autocrat. Some people felt he was the best autocrat they could have had. Um, but <laughs> the problem, the, the, and the benefit was that he kept the lid on a society that might, might be killing each other. And ultimately, they proved that they could be killing each other. Um, so I guess, I guess the question I put to you is, um, when you have autocracy, when you have a successor problem like this, um, aren't you really skirting violence, skirting the possibility of a coup d'etat, which is violent most of the time, um, skirting the possibility of a junta, which, you know, is likewise violent. If we, you know, with representative government and the peaceful transfer of power, the possibility of violence is, is limited. Um, but in any other system that we can see around the world, these autocracies, for example, violence is always at the doorstep. Am I right? Yeah, actually, you know, when Tim was talking and when you mentioned him, um, of course, Marshal Josip Broz Tito came to my mind because he is the prototypical example of what happens when the lid blows off. And the, the war in former Yugoslavia was the classical example of the conflict between ethnicities and religions and tribal structures that were in place still was just covered up by force, essentially. And once that lid fell away, it all exploded and exploded big time, right? The same for the Soviet Union. So if you, it's not necessarily always a person. The system of Soviet Union kept the lid on many things as well. And the moment that fell away, people started you know, saying we want our liberty and, and one person's liberty is the other one's slavery. So we, of course, had these kinds of problems, too. And then give it 10, 15, 20 years, people look back and say, well, you know, Tito actually wasn't that bad. Right. When he was there, he actually kept this. He kept law and order. Right. He kept this under control. He made sure that we would not kill ourselves. The same goes for the Soviet Union. Communist parties came back into power about 15, 20 years after the, the wall broke down. Poland, Hungary and so on became independent. All these countries had resurgencies of communist parties. Because they said, you know, back then we paid one whatever currency it is for bread. Now we're paying 10,000. Right. And it's not even there necessarily. Plus, we have conflict. We have social security has fallen away. All the things we were just taking for granted are gone. Why, why don't we look back at these dictators or tyrants and say, well, so bad they were not. Well, is that what's happening now? Is that the common denominator? People are looking back in history 
and saying, gee, you know, back in the old day when we had a tyrant running us, uh, things were more orderly. Um, it, it, can we say that that is happening in a number of, of these autocratic states right now? Probably, and, and, and quite frankly, also, aren't we sometimes saying that? I mean, one of the foreign policy concerns of China is not only what if it does something that is a threat to our national interests in the, in the South Pacific or something like that. It's also what happens if she actually does die and the, the system collapses? Would that create something even worse for our U.S. interests? The same goes for Iran. You know, we all say that demonstrators have a, have a cause. Uh, they're fighting for their rights, but there's also the concern, well, who comes after them, right? Who would replace the regime that's currently there? It's a, I think in foreign policy, it's a, it's a given that we always, we try to deal with the beast that we know, then create a new one, and then have to figure out how that works. So are we, in a way, tacitly, and, and not, not even malevolently when it comes to that, are we kind of encouraging um, dictatorships to a certain extent. I wouldn't say it that way, but we should ask the question of it. You know, it, it reminds me of that old, the old adage where they say, you know, democracy has its flaws, but it's, it's the best thing we got. Um, and it also, it occurs to me, and I'm, Stephanie, I like your thoughts about this, is that when you, when you look at autocracy, when you look at military juntas um, and tyrants and what have you, and chaos for that matter, um, we've covered all of those possibilities. Um, representative government and democracy with the transfer of power, allowing people to speak on it every, every interval uh, is the best system um, because it presumptively values truth and it values openness, it values diversity and so forth and change and peaceful change. Uh, so it would seem to me that what we may have learned today is the best antidote for all this autocracy and violations of human rights that we see in the world today is to preserve, really work hard at, at finding democracy as the way to preserve our public safety, at least. What do you think? Well, I think such a good point that uh, uh, we're talking here about the difference between having the rule of law and not. And uh, that's what I believe was happening on January 6th is they wanted to dispense with the rule of law and create and and one way one way to do that, but try to dispense, make it go away. But one way to do that is to evoke chaos. And um, I think that one of the reasons we came through it is because the chaos that was evoked was was handled by the people that were in it to the point where they stayed in place and they had the strong, now the strong thoughtful leaders like Pelosi and Schumer who didn't uh, go away. And, and also the, the vice president didn't go away. They didn't go and, and submit to the chaos and go running wild. They stayed in place. And the, the first thing you hear from Pelosi is when, and Schumer is when, when are we getting back in there to finish this? We're not, we're not stopping. And the expectation was to have so much chaos, I believe, and the Trump coming up there then would need to call in the Marshall M-A-R-T-I-A-L law uh, so that then he, he would be in power again. So I just see that as a cycle at whatever level. And that, that cycle would have been made huge and, and, would, have, and would have evoked more chaos across uh, the state and, and the whole country. So um, that's really interesting to me that some the people who planned that knew where, the, where to, to insert the difficulties so that they would cause the a, most- It's a playbook thing. It's a playbook the thing. At the end of the day, you know, you have chaos and then somebody surfaces as the, as the powerful well, because leader. The, yeah. <laughs> Tim, I don't, let me go to you. Off. We're, yeah. we're the, about out of time, Tim, but I wanted to ask you a question um, and also ask you to summarize your thoughts. Um, and so if I made you ruler of the world, how about a secretary general of the United Nations? And we reorganize the Security Council so the United Nations is is free to do righteous things. Okay? What would you do uh, to a world which seems to be falling prey to autocracy and military juntas and war crimes and the like? What would you do? And violations of sovereignty, 
Let's let's not forget that. Well, you always save the easy questions for me, Jay. Thank you. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, you know, the first thing I'd say is, look, we're all on this big planet together. We're on the same kettle of you know stew together. And we only have one earth and one environment. And um, we better start working together, or as Ben Franklin said, we better hang together before we hang separately. And the bottom line is, I would start saying, look, there's certain people and entities that want to uh, persuade you, influence you by these techniques of propaganda, uh, by the techniques of words that lead to populism, or techniques and words that lead to nationalism. Uh, recognize these words, recognize these strategies so that we could fight and guard against it and try to work together as a cooperative democratic society or republic and, and, and solve the world's problems cooperatively, not through uh, military strength and the comings and goings of an egomaniac uh, sociopath dictator. So suppose That's what I'd say. Thumb, they suppose they thumb your, their nose at you, Tim. What then? Well, I wouldn't be the first one to be shown the door. Shown the door. <laughs> a new kind of sanction. <laughs> Alexander, you know, your thoughts here that summarize uh, your your view of this and uh, what you would leave with our listeners. I, I very much agree with him. I think we, we have to we have to fall back to the, the rational, logical question. What are we actually doing here? And does it make any sense? Isn't there more important stuff to do? And I think the preservation of the environment and making sure that we have a planet left would probably be number one because every other question depends on it. So if we answer all the other questions and write beautiful books about it, but then we have no atmosphere to live in, to breathe and then to exist, or we destroy all life except us, and we exist in a virtual world only, then, then the end is, is there anyway. So it doesn't matter. So definitely that. Uh, I, I believe still strongly in the rule of law. I believe in the, the purpose and value of the law. But it must never become a, a tool for the dictators. Bear in mind, dictators use the law very creatively. Uh, Hitler certainly would be a good example for that. Uh, when that happens, I think everything that the law stands for crumbles and disappears. And, and we as the lawyers do the same. Would you, would you uh, support global government and enhanced I, United Nations? Uh, I think an enhanced international organization in the broader sense doesn't have to be the United Nations is always a good idea because there is so much to go in it that we, we certainly need more structure and infrastructure in place. I, I would not think that world government would be a better solution than non-world government, quite frankly. If you ask me honestly, I think the global community is better placed to resolve major issues. The local community is more better placed to resolve major issues. The ones that actually we always turn to, namely states, are actually the least likely to resolve those issues because there you have nationalism, conflict, territorial disputes, historical disputes that go back hundreds of years, make no sense. So the higher level and the lower level, I think are more rational than the government level that we look to most of the time, namely the federal government in where we look. Stephanie, I have one interesting question for you, for your summary, so to speak. And that is, uh, is humankind perfectible or not? Uh, or are we in some sort of biblical trajectory where it all ends in an apocalypse? Huh. Well, the biblical trajectory is, is probably something that is here, but not the main road. In other words, mankind, all of us in these nations, you have to understand that it's us what is that comic strip you know we looked out the enemy was us but but who is responsible for everything is all of us so that there is no god's not coming down even though he's on our side and making it right okay and the angels aren't coming and the whoever else is so it's all on us and that it, when we come to understand that the instead of trying to consolidate power and become that crazy dictator or egomaniacal single source thing that the power has to be distributed and shared and 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 all of, all the people have to take their responsibility and and so just distributed throughout the how to do this i don't know but but i think we we can see that there are paths to go forward here to think about power and and can, how to how to do the work we need to do to live here peaceably 
um, and happily. There are ways that we know to do it. It's a matter of how we're going to move forward in that. In, I'm in sure that, that if we shut ourselves in a room uh, and, um, you know, and brought in the pizza for meals, uh, we could figure <laughs> this out in in, uh, in some period of time. <laughs> Tim Apicella, <laughs> Stephanie Stoll Dalton, Alexander Morawa, thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. And we haven't solved uh, all the problems in the world, but we've, we've identified a few. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.